All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, there's a couple of announcements that I have to make this morning. Uh, one of them, two of them actually came out of the, the, the preceding class. Uh, first of all, uh, just as a reminder, we are going to be using Collaborate next week. Uh, and so we've been using Teams this past two weeks and there's been some ups and downs. It has some benefits, it has some drawbacks. Uh, and but there has been a request by several people to go back to using collaborate so we are going to use collaborate next week and then by next weekend I will put up a poll and through just a simple vote we'll figure out if we're going to stick with teams or collaborate for the remainder of the term um, that said uh, IT has requested that if you have problems with the video quality during today, this session, that you find that email from the other day uh, where I asked you to go to a website that was going to do a speed test and as well as one that gave information on your browser and then just send me those results, please, and I will forward them on to IT as well. So there's that. Um, the, 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 the thing that came up in the last class is that I no longer can put people into breakout rooms and I don't know why. Uh, my interface just has changed. They're configuring it fine, but I no longer have breakout rooms. So uh, I was planning on using that for a couple of things this class and I can't do it. I apologize on that. So yeah, uh, Benjamin, you have a question. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, for the lab portion, are the quizzes due today at 2 or is it just the um, execution of the lab? Uh, I'll talk about that in just a second. Actually, I can talk about that right now because that, that's a good time, good question. So um, there was a glitch uh, with, uh, with the Hayden McNeil website and uh, I had a student send me an email at about 9.30 last night and said it's the, the email was said, and I'm paraphrasing, you said that we had until midnight to do the labs, but it won't let me back in. And I went instantly to New Jersey. The servers are in New Jersey. So New Jersey, midnight is when it shut it down. And that is an error that I didn't think about time zones, so I reset that I figured can, was able to set a, a proper time zone so we are now actually in Pacific time uh, for this and I gave people an extension if they were doing the lab at the last minute um, but everything is fixed your quizzes are due by Monday midnight Prince George time uh, Pacific time so so everything there is fixed Benjamin does that answer your question Excellent, good. Um, that, that, there was something else that was going to come up. It was on the back of my head. Anyway, uh, oh, yes. And I had one student, and if I go to the right page, just, just as an awareness aspect. Yeah, good. Um, this should be your problem set one. One student in the last class actually had some of the numbers being replaced with letters and so just be aware that as you can see down here all of these things are numbers the exponents are 7 times 10 to the minus 5 4 times 10 to the minus 3 the answer is times 10 to the minus 2 all of those things are numbers theirs replaced it with letters and when they looked at it on the screen more closely it was numbers there so somewhere between their computer and their printer there was an error and that caused them no end of grief but just be aware that for whatever reason there was some somehow there was a substitution associated with uh with their stuff with their in their tech in their information so before I start, does anyone have any questions?
All right. Okay. So just to remind everybody where we were at last day, um, we started looking at factors affecting the rate constant and we had this, the Arrhenius equation. A and with the Arrhenius equation, it was an empirical relationship that was discovered uh, that expressed the rate constant as a function of temperature uh, and introduced the concepts of, if I can go to it, uh, a frequency factor that uh, accounted for the frequency of reactive re collisions occurring, correct orientation, and the other one was the activation energy, the reactants needing a minimum energy for a reaction to proceed. At the time this was empirical, we're going to spend today looking at the theories that have developed to explain the Arrhenius equation. We went through and we solved these uh, examples here and we finished off last day looking at uh, the one on the bottom, determining the activation energy for the decomposition of dinitrogen pentoxide. And that's where we ended off last day. I'm going to give you 10, 15 seconds now to find out if you have any questions on the material we covered till last day. Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, when it comes to the run and we're doing like the rate constant and stuff and like finding the um, reaction order, on like in the two columns, um, I noticed on the problem set there was like, for example, this is just a random number, but like 0.744 or something, there was like a bunch of runs that had that number. Um, and so when we're trying to find the concentration of A in terms of A, like can we use any constant? Because sometimes there's like a few that have the same concentration for the one side of the reactants, if that makes sense? Uh, no, I'm, I'm a little confused. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean? Okay, so when there's like uh, different runs and you're, you have to choose like a constant where they have the same number of, for the reactant, um, like it, those cancel out and then you can right. The general gist is that if you choose any one where a reactant cancels out, you should get the same number. If you if 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 your results are that you get a reaction order that's like say 1.2 or 1.3, choose another set and see if you get something closer to either one or one and a half. Okay. Okay. All right, um, just realized I have a meeting this afternoon. So uh, that, any other questions on the material we covered last day? Okay, um, what I wanna do now is actually start spending today and look at uh, collision theory and transition state theory. And then we're gonna start looking also at reaction mechanisms today. So. As I mentioned, the Arrhenius equation is empirical. It was developed from experimental observations, not from theory. And subsequent to that, collision theory and transition state theory were developed that provide a theoretical framework that explains the Arrhenius equation. And probably most importantly, it provides a link between kinetics and thermodynamics. Uh, the more we understand what's going on at an absolutely fundamental level, the better it is to be able to predict and control chemical reactions. So collision theory, collision theory simply proposes that a reaction is most probable if the reactants have sufficient energy and are in a specific orientation. So they need to have a minimum amount of energy called the activation energy so that the re reaction to occur. That energy comes from kinetics. So if you have things that come together really slowly and bounce apart, there isn't enough energy converted from kinetic to potential at the time of collision to break chemical bonds. They need to come together faster and such that the kinetic energy converts to potential energy and has the potential to actually break chemical bonds. And if you can break them, then you can form other bonds, which is 
the core of what a chemical reaction is, the changing of chemical bonds. Um, the other thing is the reactant orientation must be such that the reactive atoms are in close proximity for a reaction to proceed. That is to say, the atoms that are going to form a chemical bond, if the reaction were to proceed, need to be in contact or at least in close proximity to each other. Transition state theory uh, proposes that the reactants are actually in equilibrium with an activated complex at the transition state. So this is a reaction profile for reaction of, of course, reactants to products. Enthalpy is the vertical axis here, and you have the reactants. Now that little red gra uh, line going up off the reactants is actually just the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. How many molecules have a certain amount of energy, kinetic energy, over and above their, 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 their intrinsic internal energy? So, um, and you can see that at the top of that Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, a small fraction have enough energy to overcome the activation energy. The transition state is given the symbol, uh, that double dagger symbol that it's called the Lorraine cross, double dagger, lots of different things. Um, that funny little symbol on top of AB is the symbol given to the transition state. So what is proposed is that there is an equilibrium, okay? A and B are constantly, at the point of collision, they form this activated complex. That activated complex is transient in that it doesn't last, it's not stable. It's, there's bonds that are breaking, bonds that are forming in that activated complex. If the bonds that, the, 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 the two real options are the same bonds could reform and you go back to reactants. So you could reform A and B and the reaction doesn't proceed. So there's that equilibrium. You get up to the transition state, you go back down to reactants, up to the transition state, down to reactants. Or the other option is different chemical bonds form and you move down to form products, C and D. And generally that step going to C and D is irreversible. It doesn't go back up. That is transition state theory. How does this look like in terms of reactions? We're gonna look at two. One of them is a very simple reaction, the reaction that's presented here. Uh, reaction of atomic bromine with the chemical known as bro uh, nitrosyl bromide, BRNO. And the preferred reaction is on the far side, Br2 plus NO, bromine plus nitrogen monoxide. The activated complex exists when you have the point of collision between the reactants uh, together. And so we have these possibilities. In what one would call a reasonable or a reactive or the correct orientation, the two bromine atoms are gonna be in contact during the collision. And so they come, they collide. Now, if there's sufficient energy, it might be enough energy to break the bond between bromine and nitrogen uh, and then but the, the so that bond energy is there to break it you could go back to reactants that's the bond that could form or you could go forward to form products and so those are the two options when you have a reactive or a correct orientation at the bottom you have an orientation where the bromine atoms do not interact with each other. They're literally at opposite ends. And so there is no way for that second reaction to actually produce product. And so that or the orient for this uh, reaction, there's a lot of different angles in which the two bromine atoms can come into contact with each other, which means that there's a high probability given sufficient energy that the reaction will proceed. The two bromine atoms just have to be in contact. Uh, but the one on the bottom is such that that is the one example where you're not going to see uh, reaction. So for a reaction to take place, you need both sufficient energy and correct orientation for a reaction to occur. Um, and even then, it could still go back to form products. It's still only a probable uh, probability that the reaction will proceed to form products. As presented here, this is one of the simpler reactions where there's a fairly large angle for this reaction to occur. <coughs> 
This is the opposite. Um, this is a substrate, which is shown in molecular form in the center, the red, the white, the black, the yellow balls, uh, interacting with a protein, which is the blue ribbon. Now, the next presentation of this shows all of the atoms. And as this fills in, what you can see is that there's really only one way in which the substrate can get into the protein and react. Interacting with the protein, any other location on the outer shell of the protein is not going to lead to reaction. It needs to get into the active site of the protein. Now, granted, proteins do have ways of guiding the molecule in. It's a much more complex problem, but it still needs to get into that active site in order for a reaction to actually proceed. And the, on the other side of it, because of the way the proteins have evolved, once the substrate gets into the active site, there's a near 100% chance that the reaction will occur and you will get the desired products out. So not a 50-50, close to 100% probability. So to put this in context and to give you a little bit of information on like what's literally happening in the air around you, um, gas phase molecules in the air around you, nitrogen, oxygen, argon, carbon dioxide, um, are colliding with each other about 10 to the 30 times per second. If you continue on in chemistry and you take physical chemistry in second or third year, we will go through the calculation of this. It's actually not that bad. You just need to know the size of the atoms and how fast they're moving. You're pretty good. So gas phase molecule is involved in about 10 to the 30 collisions per second. How many of those collisions potentially lead to reaction? And the number I would think is actually quite surprising. If you're dealing with measurable reactions, so reactions that we can actually you know, measure in a laboratory, everything from an explosion where you have a detonation, it's actually still only one in 10 to the eight, one in 100 million collisions actually leads to reaction uh, in, 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 um, in, in a very fast reaction. Um, on the other end of the scale, something that is seven orders of magnitude slower, that reaction, it's only one in 10 to the 15 collisions actually leads to reaction. But that doesn't take into account the other obvious process is that the atmosphere around us is stable it isn't actually doing anything uh, left to its own devices. So in stable systems like the air around you, none of those collisions are actually leading to reaction. Okay. This is where I want was planning on putting you in uh, breakout rooms to have discussions amongst yourselves. Unfortunately, I don't have that functionality right now. So I'm just going to ask you to take 20, 30 seconds to think about these two questions. And I would appreciate people contributing to uh, that. So contributing their answers. So the two questions are, how does food cook? And at what temperature does food cook? Because this is nothing more than kinetics. Go for it. Think about it and share your answers, please. Thank you. Come on, some of you must have had a high school teacher or um, someone that talked, or you did a project on how does food cook? How does food cook?
Anyone? Please? That's why breakout rooms would be so much more, more valuable. Chemical reactions, transfer of energy, yep. What's happening in the food itself? What does the heat do? What does the heat do to the food? Yeah, it requires energy. Uh, what chemical reaction? Three words or two. The molecules are changing, breaking apart, but that's exactly what I know. I want to know exactly what molecules are breaking apart and how are they breaking apart? You know this. If you've taken biology, you know this. This is nothing more than a biochemical process for how food cooks. Okay, Pro, uh, proteins and carbohydrates. Let's just back up to proteins. Uh, hopefully not bacteria. There we go. Um, so we have a few people talking now. We have someone saying proteins denatured and Afrin saying breaks hydrogen bonds. And do you want to expand on that verbally, either of you? Class is so quiet. So the they are both correct. Enzymes don't cause food to cook per se. No, they don't. Um, but it is truly just the fundamental process of cooking a food is protein denaturation. So the classic common example is to take an egg, for example. Now, if you take that egg and you break it apart, Haley, I'll get to the Maillard reactions in just a bit. You take that egg and break it apart, you have the egg white and you have the egg yolk. The egg white is itself clear, it is translucent, but it is made up of proteins. They are globular proteins. So they're like little balls and that allows the egg white to be fluid. It can move back and forth because these Ball, globular proteins just kind of slide and move around each other. Um, that is the egg white under normal conditions. What happens is that heat, well sorry, the proteins are held together by hydrogen bonds. So there's a long strand of uh, the protein backbone, the, uh, the, the, yeah, the strand of the protein backbone, and all of the protein amino acids, amino acid strand is what I meant to say, uh, have the ability to form hydrogen bonds and they rearrange themselves to give you that globular protein shape. The hydrogen bonds are the weakest part of the protein. So when you add heat to a uh, egg or to any food, it starts disrupting those hydrogen bonds. And so what was a nice globular protein that had a specific shape and function ends up turning into strands of the amino acid backbone. It's one long strand. It might break apart somewhere else, but it generally is just long strands. And so as these proteins denature, then they just randomly interlink. And so they randomly overlap and form other hydrogen bonds that ends up turning your globular proteins into one large mat of, of, of what ends up being white in color now, um, cooked egg white. The egg yolk is the same thing, but I'm using egg white simply because it's more obvious to see. So the answer is simply the, the cooking is the denaturation of proteins and then they just randomly overlap to form uh, what we would call cooked food. This is also what kills bacteria in food. So the food you eat, hamburger, hamburger is probably the worst example. It has bacteria in it. Hamburgers, chicken spoil very quickly in the fridge on the order of a few days. Uh, even in the fridge at, 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 at the fridge temperatures, they will spoil because the in the forming of hamburger, you end up beating bacteria in, in the, the maceration process. So 
every time you eat hamburger, you're actually eating proteins that are living off of the hamburger. You need to cook it well because the denaturation that happens to the proteins in the hamburger also happens to the bacteria. And if you denature the proteins in the bacteria, you just kill them and they no longer are, can, can infect your body. They are dead in the food. So that is the first question. Um, how does food cook? The answer is the denaturation of proteins. Um, there is more to it. We'll talk about the Maillard reactions in a little bit, but that is the, the denaturation of proteins is the primary reaction that's occurring there. The second reaction question here is at what temperature does food cook at? Go ahead, answer that question for me. Go ahead, Ty. No, never mind. You didn't say anything, so that's okay. What temperature does food cook at? Anyone? Higher temperature increases the chances to break bonds. Yep, but what temperature would that be? Does anyone have a number? Warm or hot? Yeah, well, I burned myself the other day. I don't know if you can see it. It's a pretty nice burn on my hand. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> moving on in life. Uh, at, we'll call it a hot temperature. 70, 75 degrees Celsius, that's actually pretty good. Um, around 71, yeah. Uh, does any one of you who said 70, 71, 75 want to comment on that? That's around one, yeah, 160 Fahrenheit is close enough. Somewhat depends on the type of food. Not really, though. William, Logan, Afrin. Uh, you seem to remember that from Food Safe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, 80 is in the range there, too. So, the temperature which food cooks at is anywhere from about 65 to, well, 60 to 80 degrees Celsius. Different references give you different sources. It also depends on how well you want your food cooked. And we'll talk about that in this picture. So I'll talk about what temperature food cooks at in just a few seconds, follow up on that. So let's get back to that egg example. That egg example is, these are two Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions, the energy of molecules as a function of their temperature. And at 273, which is zero Celsius, or we'll just call it the temperature of the fridge, you have the blue profile and boiling water, 373 Kelvin, is the red profile. Now let's go back to consider that egg. We have that egg that is there, and when you take the egg out of the fridge and you put it in the water, that egg by itself, at zero degrees Celsius, nothing's happening to it at all. There are absolutely an insufficient number of molecules that can react. It's down to zero according to this profile. And the egg will sit there and do quote unquote nothing in your fridge for a couple weeks, couple months. It doesn't actually cook in your fridge. The bacteria will actually start making the eggs go bad before the egg actually quote cooks. But you take that out, you put it in boiling water and depending on how you want your eggs done, you put them in there for six, seven minutes, you get a soft boiled egg, you put them in there for 12 to 15 minutes, you get a hard boiled egg. What's happening is that at the elevated temperature, there's a slight fraction of molecules that have an energy sufficient for reaction. They move above that minimum reaction energy and so they find each other and they react. And, but they don't get to 100 degrees Celsius. The outer edge of the egg, so the outer edge of the egg is here. Yep, it's in contact with boiling water, so it's at 100 degrees Celsius. But as you move towards the center, you have a temperature gradient, and that temperature goes down. Everything started off at, you know, a couple degrees. The heat is moving inwards. If you only leave it in the boiling water for six, seven minutes, you get a soft-boiled egg where the center of that egg only gets to be around 60, 55, 60 degrees. It actually isn't cooked the egg yolk is still runny, meaning that it hasn't denatured and hasn't overlapped. 
That's a soft boiled egg. Um, if you cook it for longer, more heat gets to the center and you get to around 75 degrees Celsius and the center of the egg starts, is at that temperature. The proteins have denatured, they've overlapped and you end up with a hard boiled egg. So at the low end of the spectrum, 65-ish degrees, you have a soft boiled egg uh, and, and, and it's the bare minimum for denaturing the bacteria and killing them. At the high end, it's around 75, 80 degrees Celsius for the cooking to occur. Right, then there's the Maillard reactions. Before I get to the Maillard reactions, I want to mention to you that before the advent of microwaves, food was more flavorful by quite a bit um, because of the Maillard reaction. Now, this is a different classification of reaction, but it is critically important to something in food. What is that something that the Maillard reactions provide to food? One word answer. Anyone know what it is? I actually even gave it to you a few seconds ago. What does the Maillard reactions provide to food? Yes, flavor. They provide the cooked flavor of food. So this is a reaction between proteins and sugar. And it really only occurs above about 120 degrees Celsius, which means it only can occur on the surface of food, the area that is in contact with the high heat. While the inside of this turkey is slowly warming up to, um, slowly warming up to around 70 degrees Celsius, 75 degrees Celsius to become cooked, the outer surface is exposed to air that's in the oven 250, 300 degrees Celsius and, or sorry, that's Fahrenheit in Celsius, I don't know what that is, but the Maillard reactions occur when you get to about 120 degrees Celsius and the proteins and sugars react to form what is called generally just the browning that you see here. And it is that browning that produces oh so flavorful goodness associated with food. Now, a couple more examples associated with this. If you want to, if you want to try this for yourself, okay, how many people here eat hot dogs? How many people here are willing to admit that they eat hot dogs? A few, excellent, good, excellent. So, sometimes, rarely, good. We got, ah, Ju Justine, Justine, is a uh, aficionado of the Costco hot dog and someone else loves the post. Um, believe it or not, I actually contacted Costco a few years ago about that, but the, the, I'll, I'll get to that in a few seconds since I've got the time. Um, I mentioned earlier that the advent of microwaves has decreased the quality of food because it doesn't allow for browning. A microwave oven only heats water and the maximum temperature you can get in a microwave is 100 degrees Celsius. So you don't get the flavor forming of the Maillard reactions in food, which brings you to the Costco hot dogs. They're cooked by putting them in boiling water. My challenge to you, my challenge to you for those of you that buy hot dogs and cook them is to take a package of hot dogs and put hot dogs in boiling water, but at the same time take another one or two hot dogs and either cook them on a barbecue or at the least case, put them in a frying pan and cook them on your stove to the point where you get browning on the outside. And so you put it over medium heat, medium high heat, and you just let it roll for a bit and they cook in maybe a little bit longer, maybe about five, seven, 10 minutes, depending on the temperature you use. But you wanna get a sheen of fat and browning on the outside. The fat's been there even in the boiled one, so you've got it. Now try the two different hot dogs. And what you're gonna find, very likely, is that the hot dogs that were cooked in boiling water 
are pretty bland. Whereas the exact same hot dogs cooked on a frying pan or on a barbecue or over a fire are oh so much more flavorful. The difference is only the Maillard reactions on the surface. The inside is the exact same. It gets up to 65, 75 degrees Celsius. It's the outside Maillard reactions. And honestly, boiled hot dogs are not great. Cooked hot dogs on a frying pan or a barbecue or a fire, much more delicious. I missed what you said earlier, Justine. Free drinks with that too. Okay, yeah. So who's all going to Costco after class? Kidding. I have a meeting, so I can't. What it comes down to is yes. Oh, right. The last one is steak. I'm just giving you all of these ideas in case someone just wants to invite me over for a meal. Turkey's good. Steak is good. Hot dogs, kind of sketchy. For those of you who like steak that is rare, you need, it needs to be cooked uh, on very high heat on a, bar, uh, on, on a barbecue or on a grill. So the temperature needs to be very high, not to sear in the liquid or anything to that effect, but what ends up happening is that you want to get the browning because the browning is the only source of flavor, especially on raw meat. Um, and so with a high grill, you heat up the outside edge really only, it browns quite quickly, you flip it over, you brown the other side, and so then you serve something that is literally cold in the middle and got browning on both sides, and that is a rare steak. Needs to be cooked on high heat. If you eat your steak medium well or well done, it actually needs to be cooked on a much lower grill, lower temperature grill, because you need time for the heat to work its way through to the center of the meat and cook it all, 65, 75 degrees. Um, and you don't, if you were to put it on a really high grill, it would actually burn, carbonize the outside, which is bad. You don't want that. It needs to be a low temperature. And over the course of the time that it actually permeates down to the center, you actually get browning on the outside as well. So you get it the way you like it, medium well or well, plus you get the Maillard reactions on the outside. So, can we hear the Costco story? Oh, I, I have a friend, um, actually I have a friend in engineering and we're trying to, who, well, at the time they were looking for a project to do and one of the things is, is there a way that we can take the boiled hot dogs at Costco and actually run them through a device that would brown the outside edges at, a, at the rate that Costco goes through hot dogs. That, that ultimately is the challenge, that Costco goes through hot dogs pretty quickly, so you need to find a way to brown them in literally minutes uh, or, well, yeah, that type of idea. So that was the idea of a small little device that would actually do that. And, um, well, no one has come up with one yet, so if there's any budding engineers out there, I want royalties. Who eats steak well done? I do. Sorry. And am I a psychopath? Thanks, William. Maybe. <laughs> you haven't seen your exam yet, William. <laughs> All right. The example that I just gave you on Kinetics of Cooking a, it's good because it, 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 it talks about a lot of the things that we covered here, relates it to what you're doing, but you have projects that you're going to be uh, doing in class as well. That's the idea. Take something that is associated with being a chef and you wouldn't, I talked generally about everything. You could literally have a project that is on Maillard reactions because it is an evolving uh, area. The entire area of food cooking is evolving and so, so yeah. Take one aspect of that, the Maillard reactions, and run with it to, uh, a, a, as a project. But that's, that's kind of the idea of, uh, of, of, of the student projects that you're going to need to be doing. Find something and make it engaging and exciting and look at the chemistry behind it. If the Maillard reactions were the one you're doing, you'd have a lot more stuff on the chemistry, the actual reactions that are taking place. Uh, and a lot more of the properties and conditions and stuff like that. So I kind of just glossed over it because 
it's an example, but not the focus of this material, but it is something that one could take and run with. So, uh, Pollock, you have a question. I know what you're talking about, and I, uh, your, your point is a very good, your question is very good, given that I just talked about hamburger and how hamburger, the grinding process, literally grinds bacteria into the hamburger, which means it needs to be cooked well done to kill the bacteria before eating it. The thing with steak is that it is done, cooked, it is, it is pre prepared differently. The outside edge of a steak needs to hit 65, 75 degrees Celsius. It has to, it needs to get higher than that because if you want the browning, but it needs to get to a minimum of 65, 75 degrees Celsius to kill the bacteria. The bacteria are on the surface. There is no bacteria in the middle of the steak because there's no way for it to get in there. Now, if that steak had been punctured with say a knife or a fork and left for a bit, yeah, you have bacteria on the inside and that could actually cause someone to get sick because that bacteria in the middle will not die through protein denaturation. The inside of that steak, of a rare steak, is actually raw meat. It's, if for people that truly eat it rare, it is room temperature, 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, the ideal temperature for, protein, for, for bacteria to multiply and divide. But the bacteria and ideally are on the outside and when you grill the steak one side and then the other it gets to over 100 degrees celsius and those protein and those bacteria die does that answer your question palak for sure thank you all right medium rare is the right answer for his exam only if you don't want to get all the marks anyway <clears throat> moving on uh right we have course don't we something like that yes kinetics of cooking all right is there anything else in here that i need to talk to but why does chicken have to be cooked thoroughly then? Chicken, I don't completely have a good answer to you on that other than check, oh, chicken has a lot more bacteria that seem to flourish on the surface of chicken. That's about all I can say. More porous skin, thank you, David. Um, and so, uh, and if you've ever had chicken that you put in the fridge, a steak in the fridge, and a piece, I have done this personally, steak in the fridge, piece of chicken in the fridge, like on a plate type of idea covered, the chicken gets slimy in about a week. Definitely slimy. The steak is perfectly fine after a week. A lot more bacteria growth on the chicken. Don't know why. Sweet deal. All right. That actually concludes our discussion on the factors affecting the rate constant. We looked at transition state theory. We looked at collision theory. Um, and that will help you uh, explain uh, the work on the problem set questions. What I want to do now is look at reaction mechanisms. What time is it? Quarter, ooh, quarter after. Okay, so in reaction mechanisms, um, this is one of the sections in the, where we are not going to be doing the in-depth determining the reaction mechanism. We are only going to be covering this material to the length and depth that I'm t covering it here which is quite literally drawing reaction profiles and explaining the idea that a reaction is not um, what it seems to be. So we write down a chemical reaction and up until this point in time you've written down a chemical reaction and I don't think too many people have thought about what's actually occurring in the reaction vessel. Is it in the beaker, in the air, in the water, in the cooking? What's actually occurring? The reaction that we write down is very likely not what is occurring in the reaction vessel. What is occurring are something called elementary reactions. Those are the reactions that are actually occurring. So in there, they look weird. They're not what you would normally see. Um, when you take a bunch of elementary reactions, 
So a series of elementary reactions that add up to the overall chemical equation, you have what's called a reaction mechanism. The reason why chemists, kineticists, study chemical reactions and try to determine what the reaction mechanism is, try to determine what the elementary reactions are, is that if we understand the elementary reactions, then we can control and optimize the reaction. So to look at a couple of very simple reaction mechanisms, um, this is the decomposition of ozone to produce oxygen. Uh, O3 goes to 3O2. Um, this reaction proceeds via a two-step mechanism. That is, ozone, the first step of the reaction is the breaking up of ozone to produce O2 plus oxygen. And the second step is another ozone molecule reacting with atomic oxygen to produce two oxygen molecules. So instead of two ozones coming together and reacting, it starts off by one ozone molecule breaking apart and then another reaction with an, and then producing another reaction with another ozone molecule. The example here is to sketch the reaction coordinate, to literally create the reaction profile for this reaction. And there we have here uh, a number of uh, the, the, the steps, the energies of the reactants, the intermediates and the products, and the activation energies. And so what we are going to do is we are going to go and sketch this. So this is the reaction profile. O3 producing O2. The vertical axis is the enthalpy in kilojoules. And the horizontal axis is something called the reaction coordinate. It's not a unit per se, it's just the steps along the reaction. So first of all, we look at the reactants and we have the reactants of two ozone molecules is, oh, sorry, need a vertical axis, right. It needs to go from about zero to 500. about right. So 285 is the first one. 1, 2, 285. Oops. And that is two ozone molecules there. Then the next step, the entities have 393 kilojoules. And that is O3 plus O2 plus oxygen. It's a little bit longer. And the final one is all of them at oxygen, and that is down at zero. Here we've got three O2 molecules. So those are the entities. Now we can take that and we can look at the activation energies. The first one has an activation energy of 107 kilojoules. And if you do the math, you find out that that's actually no barrier at all. It just comes up. That is 107 kilojoules right there. You're literally just breaking a chemical bond. So you have to put energy in to break a chemical bond. And to break that oxygen bond in ozone, it's 107 kilojoules. For the next one, there's an activation energy of 17 kilojoules, which on this graph is about right there. And it goes up and then it comes back down.
and that is the activation energy for that second reaction. So we take that, and that's the reaction profile of this reaction. If you want to see what it looks like when a computer draws this reaction, you get something very similar to what I have drawn on the graph. I'm expecting you to be able to, given data, create a reaction profile um, as presented here. I know we're running a little bit close to time. I would just like to, f just give me a second here. Where are we at? Yeah. All right. I'm going to, because I want to put it all together, call it right there and conclude for today's class. And when we come back next day, we will continue looking at this material. So. That's all, folks. Uh, so just a reminder, you have a quiz starting on Monday on Problem Set 1, and you have your lab report quizzes due Monday at midnight, local time. That's it. Does anyone have any questions? That was a turkey, by the way, Grace. You can all go out to, co if you don't want to cook it yourself, go to Superstore, Costco, wherever, buy yourself a rotisserie chicken. Yeah, invite me over. All right, what do you mean you left the meeting? <laughs>